Hey, welcome back to Broker Talk. When you ask the question, why design is important, you will find it allows you to make a positive first impression on potential customers. It has been shown that human beings from an initial impression within a couple of seconds, but it takes longer than this to alter that perception once a first impression has been made. Another question is, why is important? Why is art important in our lives? Art can help us understand our history, our culture, our lives, and the experience of others in a manner that cannot be achieved through other means. It can also be a source of inspiration, reflection, and joy. My guest today is John Colon. He's a graphic designer, artist, art professor, and he owns his own gallery. I'm pleased to have you join Broker Talk today, John. Thanks so much. Hi, Larry. Thank you for inviting me here today. Um, Broker Talk is, is set up to have interesting discussions about important subjects, and I think both art and design are, but I'm a real estate agent. From, a, from someone who is an artist and a designer, why do you think it's important? It's, it's so important. Um, one person asked me one time, um, what do you do? And um, they were being flip and they were an engineer and a professor. And they and I thought for a second, well, um, I'm looking at your tie. And, you know, did you realize that a designer or an artist had something to do with the tie yes. and the belt was designed and your belt buckle was designed and your suit jacket was designed and um, the patterns on it were made by artists and seamstresses sewed it. So literally everything that we look at has to get manufactured or, or made or actually like visually um, thought of. And you need designers and artists to make that happen. Right. And and from a real estate point of view, I, I think that everything in a house was designed. Architects are designers. Uh, uh, in fact, many architects consider themselves the greatest of artists. <laughs> um, I've heard that from architects, by the way. But everything that you have and you bring in your house is is part of that. And it can make you feel good or or not. Um well, you know, like, if, you know, I went to see Falling Water in, um, outside of Pittsburgh, and I thought... Um, Frank Lloyd Wright House. Yes, and and he, he literally designed the furniture. Um, every single object in that building was designed by him. So there was like a couple of small little spaces where he left an opportunity for the tenant or the person that would live there to put up something of their own and so it was like total control and I, I you know architects are really important to the world and, and everything but um, sometimes maybe they should leave some of the choices to the people that are living in the houses well you know narcissism and aside you know he, he was a fantastic uh, architect and built many, many beautiful buildings um, using the the shape of the land. I, I think in Japan, they call that situi, situo, something like that, where you you go and you sit on the land and and you figure out where the sun comes up, where it goes down, how you want to live within that house. And one of the things I always do as, as a real estate agent, if somebody is looking to buy a house, I said, tell me about some of your favorite rooms. We've all lived in, in more than one place in our lives. And, and we have favorite places. You know, maybe it was, uh, for me, I always liked living right next to, um, school, uh, elementary schools, because uh, I was a writer before I was, you know, photographer before I was a real estate agent. And I loved the 10 o'clock recess because it was such joy, sound of joy, but it was also a time marker. Um, how uh, how important is it where you live and, and what you do in relation to the art that you have in your house and the design? Yeah, I think, I mean, I was I was kind of fortunate enough to grow up in a contemporary house in a in way out in the country. My my father designed the house 
And then he um, had an architect. Well, he went, he was an artist and he went to RISD and he knew how he would want a house to be designed inside. And so we lived in this neighborhood which had all colonial little houses and we had a contemporary flat roof house and it was a box, you know, and, and we looked out the back into the woods because um, I lived way out in the country. And um, so, and the space was a big open space with, with paintings on the wall and an open floor format and, you know, bedrooms off to the side. So it was always like this big space with high ceilings, even though it wasn't a very big house, it just felt bigger because of the interior design. And, and so then, you know, in the summers, I would spend time at the beach and I had this vista of Point Judith and the, and the lighthouse and the ocean and just this open space. And it was one of those kind of salt shack houses that had all windows on one side and another big open space. And so I've always found that I, I've been drawn to a place where I could at least look out the window and see something interesting and have some air. And then, um, you know, the art on the wall is important. And one of the things that I, I found was that it's not permanent when you grow up in a house with an artist and it it moves, you know? And so, you know, that's something that I, I really, you know, like about having the gallery is that I have, I get to live with this artwork for a month or five weeks or more. And, and then it changes and I have a whole other view um, in the room of work to see and, and to live with an experience. And so the change, the, the transformation of a space can happen all the time. And so I, I really like spaces that are open to that that change. I, I realize that some rooms, you can't change where the bed is because the architect designed where the bed goes and that sort of thing. But the artwork on the walls can move and, and be seasonal. So right. it's always been a, a thing where I could be, have a view someplace um, sure. to just see something. Sure. Sure. Well, um, bringing up your gallery, I know you're sitting in your gallery, the hall space um, in Dorchester, Mass. Um, by the way, some people might not know RISD is Rhode Island School of Design, a great, uh, great design uh, place. Many famous people have come there, uh, come from there, including you. Didn't, weren't you also? Uh, no, I went to Rhode Island College, which is known as RIC, and we have a very good art department there. And um, I then went to museum school later on for, um, I originally went to school for sculpture and graduated in that. And then I went back to school for painting and printmaking. And somehow or another, I ended up working in design and uh, right when I got out of school. So I've been doing this for, oh, you know, 40 something years. Um, talk to me about your, your gallery itself. Uh, again, so I, I know the, the, the space, it's a great big open space, white walls, like most galleries, good lighting. Um, what what uh, made you want to own a gallery? Because it's not easy. It was, it was uh, sort of like uh, by chance, you know, I was on um, Thayer Street, which is now called SOA in Boston South End, and the buildings have all been rehabilitated there and turned into a gallery scene. And previous to that is where all the artists used to reside. You know, they, it was kind of like a rundown space that every, you know, the, and so the, the, floor that I was on, I was on the top floor of this huge building. And so the artists that lived on the floor used to store all their paintings in the hallway. And after um, a few years, they started to move out and the spaces became empty. And then the hallway became cleared out. And it was, I looked at it, it was 50 feet long and 12 feet wide and 13 feet high. And it looked like a gallery space to me. And so I fixed the sheetrock and I added some lights and I painted it and I didn't know what to call it. And it was a hallway. So I called it hall space. And I, I really didn't want it to be my identity so much as it wanted it to be its own identity. And so I, I just kind of started. And, you know, when you start a a business like that. I mean, I had, there were only maybe one other gallery on the street at the time. Right. I hung a flag out on the fourth floor out the window. And there was another business down the street, Top Dog and Fashion, Charles Edward Powers, who's now in Hollywood, um, doing a lot of different sorts of uh, fabric um, 
textile installations for awards and things. Um, so it was just a few of us. And I mean, there were all artists everywhere. So it was really sort of, e not easy, but it was, you know, there were, everyone wanted to have a show. I was painting. Um, I didn't open the space for myself. I've absolutely, I have never shown my work in any show in the gallery since I started in, in 1996. And so it's always been for everyone else. And um, and at the time, <laughs> galleries were a little, galleries in Boston were, there weren't as many galleries as there are now, actually. I mean, people think, oh, we don't have a lot of galleries, but there are a lot more galleries now. And, and they're a lot more fluid. I mean, there's more galleries coming and going and younger people running the galleries. And in a way, it's kind of, I think, easier and friendlier now than it was back then. And so I wanted to create an atmosphere where it was for the artists first. And I, I've always maintained that it's for the artists first. And so, um, and based on some sort of merit and not about whether the work sells or not or anything like that. And, I'm, and I'm also show work that has content and it's not just purely decorative work and there's other meaningful um, Right. things that are happening in the work. Well, one of the wonderful things about your studio and, and your approach to the studio is that you bring in artists who aren't affiliated with any other gallery and give them an opportunity to show their work. I've been to many shows there and um, the camaraderie in there, I mean, the artists come out to see the other artists work and, and to support them. That's uh, And discussions happen and all of that. So community is built up around uh around that thing um yeah yes it has it, it, um uh you know boston's pretty small in in reality i mean everyone sort of know I, I mean there's always people that don't know it, all the places that are available and everywhere but um sooner or later artists find you and so my 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 the, the people that come to the gallery and people always ask how do how do people find Dorchester you in Dorchester and because they're real really there's no other galleries around here um there you know people that are interested in art make it to the places that sure. it shows. and then over time I mean people find you know once they find me um they continue to come and and so it's been um, word of mouth. Um, I, I do a little bit of advertising here or there, but not a lot. Um, right. And so it's it's interesting in that um, the community itself, uh, I'm kind of in that scene, you know, and I'm not really in the in the com some other kind of commercial gallery scene. If you start to look into the commercial gallery scene, um, you the South End. Well, not all the galleries are like that, but there's connections to different places and people share work and, and, and it's, you know, it's a, it's more of a, a business of selling objects and not really about designing and installing exhibitions and, and having a narrative or some story to tell or allow the artist to tell their own story. Sure. And I, um, you're on a prominent street in Dorchester, so I never had a problem finding where you were, but finding parking is the issue. <laughs> yeah, there is some parking in the parking lot here, um, but the it, it's actually fairly easy right now. To, they, they, the construction across the street is cleared up, so the parking is returned, and wow. um, and the people that moved in there, they they had to have parking in the building, so it helps a little bit that the cars that moved in are in the building and not on the street. You were um, a college professor for a good number of years teaching art and design. Um, how over the years have the students changed? Because I know uh, when you started, there weren't cell phones. You know, that wasn't that long ago. But now everybody's kind of stuck like that, you know. And, uh, well, so you know, I, yeah, we, we, when I started, there were smoke signals. Um, and so, yes, students, um, I started teaching around 1997, 98, and students at that time, a lot of them did not have a computer at home. And so I had been hired to teach graphic design 
and use technology because um, back in around 1986, when Apple and uh, technology started to roll into the graphic design industry, about half of all the graphic designers at the time said, no, we won't need the technology. We won't need to be on a computer. And I thought, once I saw that I could draw a box on the computer and it prints out in like two seconds, I'm thinking this is the way it's going to go because I won't have to draw a box anymore. And, um, you know, and so I just tried to learn everything I could. But students in, came in and they didn't know how to do anything, really. They didn't, they had, they were fearful of the computer. They thought they could break it. Um, at the beginning. At the beginning, yeah. And and then um, slowly more and more high schools and schools had computers and students got a little more educated, mostly like they learned some basic skills in Photoshop or something. Um, I teach in an art school, Montserrat College of Art. And the students that go to a school like Montserrat College of Art, they kind of have a like a step a leg up on some students that are going to a liberal arts school because they they already sort of know what they want to do. And so they're not like testing the waters in a lot of different fields. They're testing the waters in a visual arts school. And so they come there sort of prepared to work. And, um, I, you know, it's probably, I mean, Montserrat College of Art is like an island, you know, you go up to this place and you walk in and it's the, it's the safe zone for every sort of person uh, type of person that exists in this world. That's so, art I mean, schools anyway. A, a lot of art schools, I've been to a lot of different art schools. They come in all different sizes and shapes, and it depends on where they are. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're pretty scrappy. Yeah. Yeah. I have uh, I have a degree from a liberal arts school, uh, studied literature. That's why I don't have a job. Um, but uh, went to graduate school in an Ivy League school and then went to art school in San Francisco. And in art school, you're absolutely right. You have all different types of people, people with just wacky ideas that they work and work and work on. And all of a sudden you see the brilliance in them. But there's also people that just... Um, they're using it because they want to, they think they're artists rather than being dedicated to this work. And um, I know from the, I didn't get a degree. I didn't need a degree from my art school. I was there for a year, learned. It was a matter of putting film through a camera, you know, editing and, and all of that and went out and started working. Um, there are so many different kinds of jobs if you have a creative mind if you aren't broken up and, and so wrote, like, like an engineer. Engineers, they have to be very precise in everything that they do. Art, the more precise you are, the better your work is, but there's no, uh, there's no formula that says you have to do it this way or that way. My first job was working for this graphic designer. His name is Malcolm Greer, and he, he passed away a couple of years ago. And he was um, very well known. Um, he he designed things like the Sinesta Hotel's identity and the HHS thing that you see, the Health and Human Services logo. And so he had all different types of projects. And he hired me, and and I didn't know anything about graphic design um, at the time. And and he said, "Will you learn?" everything from me. And I, I mean, there were like, like 100 people trying out for this job. I have no idea why he hired me, but he hired me. And um, he used to tell us all the time that, you know, art is where the idea is. It begins with an idea. And if you have a concept or an idea, then you can make something happen. Right. The design happens in the execution, in, in, in sort of making that work. Wow. So when you make it do what it's supposed to do, that's where the design process happens. And, and students, um, I think they come to school. And one of the things that's different about when I went to school in art and now is that, and, and I got this lesson at museum school. When I went to museum school, there was an artist um, painter there. His name was Henry Schwartz, and he's a fantastic painter. And um, he he said to us on like the first day of class, you know, you don't you don't have to be here, you know. And he would say that to me every now and then. He'd say, you know, you don't have to be here. You can go out and do it yourself right now. 
you know, and, and when I was in school, my professors never encouraged us to even do that. And when I opened the gallery, many people asked me why I didn't make it a nonprofit. And I always thought it was important that artists should be able to make money. Like, I mean, I think nonprofits are really important to the arts. I think that it's, it, it's, it's, it's just, you need it. Um, but um, the idea that my students can go out and make money and earn a living at this profession before they graduate from college is, is kind of a really important philosophy to like sort of instill on them early on. And so the students that really want to be there, the students that are really working, um, all the students that I've had in my program, um, they usually find jobs. They yeah. usually get work and they're, they are dreaming sometimes when they're younger. And we all did that. We all fantasize about like what could happen. But I, I really think that um, because Montserrat is so small and the students there get such close um, attention to all of their needs, like there's all sorts of different things that are happening emotionally and psychologically. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of different issues that students have now that have been weighed into the classroom, you know, and so it's a, it's a much different environment. And so the work environment, I think, is changing too. We're going to see that happening. I, I mean, COVID really switched everything up on the way we think about going to work. Here we are on a Zoom meeting. Um, you know, it's it would I don't know if I would have ever been able to sit looking at myself this long before. <laughs> I'm not looking at myself. I'm looking at you. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> That's the trick. <laughs> Never look at yourself. <laughs> um, but. Um, you know, the, the students of today are digital. They were born as digital natives. So they don't have any of that fear about breaking something because they know, you. well, you can break it by dropping it, but uh, it's it's hard to break it by using it. Um, and They're very much more aware of the what people see, you know, right. what they put out in public eye. They're much more aware of that. Uh, they're, I think... Um, one of the things is that they don't, they have to, uh, you know, it, it's being clear about what you're trying to show people. And right. so at first it's not quite what it is that you want, but they can switch that up, you yeah. know? So it's not the fear of the operating system. It's not the fear of erasing something or restarting it or doing any of those simple little tasks that, that can help you. I owned a video company for a good number of years and I was doing uh, commercial work for corporations. And, and when you didn't back up or you didn't save your work, you know, every couple of minutes, you can lose, especially in video, you can lose all of that. And that that was frustrating. You learn pretty quickly, save, 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 you know. Well, that's one of the lessons on the first day of school is everyone needs to understand that they need to have their work regardless of if they lost it on a bad drive, they have to back everything up. And yeah. that still happens. It happens all the time to people. I mean, we're all a little bit clumsy. There's so many different, there's so much data coming and going that it is possible to, to, to lose something. Um, but I think um, the students are aware of that more and more. It's easier now. You don't have to have all these floppy disks and and side quests and you know what you name it. We had zip drives. I mean, with with the cloud services and Google drives and different places, Dropbox. You can save your work in a lot of different places. It makes it a lot easier and. I mean, in, in real estate, I mean, in all with the idea that you can share photographs really quickly, um, you know, you can take pictures, sending send someone and they can make a, you know, with the phone. I mean, it's it's an it's an incredible like tool. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. I mean, cameras everywhere. Um, the privacy part is a little weird and we all need to get used to it, I think, in a different way based on right. like been around a long time. I, I like, I named the gallery Hall Space to be somewhat anonymous, sure. uh, <laughs> you know? And so it's, it, the privacy thing is definitely something um, that is, is coming up. Yeah, right. Yeah. But, you know, um, when George Orwell wrote 1984, he was looking into the future 
you know, where the government knew everything. And and then Facebook and these social media came around and everybody gave up all their information. You know, there's too much information about a lot of people. I said, like, dial it back a bit, would you please? <laughs> I mean, I think Timu probably has more information about us than the government, but, you know, who knows? Who? Timu, you know, it's like an online store. They just gather information on people and they're buying stuff. And, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Um, I did a, a job years ago for a company and what the, what they did um, was it was... Um, Oh God, I forget what, what it was called. But if you were walking down a store and with your cell phone that and you walked by, say you uh, uh, need Motrin, you know, uh, you'd walk by that thing and you would get a ping on your phone. Oh, do you need Motrin? You said you needed Motrin. I'm thinking, how do they know that? You know, um, and please listen to you now, too. You know, it's kind of crazy. I oh, think so. That's like, so uh, there's an artist, BB Beard. Um, I'm, we're talking about cell phones, and and a few years ago she did a show here, and um, she did these drawings with um, ball bearings, and she dropped the ball bearings in iron oxide. Um, it's magnetic, and then she used a a magnet to move the ball bearings on paper, and then she had um, a composer composed music or noise that would go along with these abstract drawings that she was creating with magnets and ball bearings with black iron oxide on them. And all of this, and she was videotaping it from the top. And so she could edit the videos and erase the drawing and bring it back and go forward. And, and then she made them into small files that you would have on your cell phone so that while you're on the train or somewhere, you can like enjoy this video art, but it was made specifically for cell phones. And so, um, you know, I think there's more and more, I mean, we all with Instagram and all the media that's on there now, it's sort of our entertainment is on the phone. I mean, I watch my students watching um, HBO Max on their cell phone and I'm like, you can't have two, pictures going at the same time but you know there's video on their phone so it, the phone is sort of this in thing that we can't we'll never get rid of right exactly. right um, interestingly so, enough this show uh it goes on youtube and it goes on on the broker doc, uh, uh talk uh website but uh it's also on um iTunes and, and those kind of places. And many, many people will not be watching us, but listening to it while they're, because it's a half an hour show, they'll, they'll listen to it in hopes of, of um, learning something about whatever our subject is. So have we taught anybody anything yet? I'm not really sure. Um, <laughs> but, you know, if, if you're, um, I, I think that people, I just re recently juried a, a show at the Concord Art and it was the all members show. And um, it was interesting to go there the other day and, and look at all this work. And uh, and there are all these people and they're all different age groups. I mean, they're from, you know, basically like late teens to 90s, you know, and they're making artwork and they're hobbyists most of them and uh they really love it and they enjoy it and it's sort of you know and and i would think like sometimes you look at art and say oh that's good therapy and you know and but i don't think that it was therapy for most of the people that had submitted work it was something that they just like to do yeah. and um, so you know you can learn you can learn by seeing and I think that all of these people that spend their time trying to draw something or make something, um, they're learning something about what it is they're looking at, but they're also learning something about themselves. And so it takes time. It's not one of those things where um, it's instant gratification. And so the idea of instant gratification is something that these cell phones and uh, and the media brings to us. We want like we want the answer now. So in a way, we don't have to remember some telephone numbers because it's automatically built into the phone. We don't have to remember a lot of different things because we could just look it back up again. And so that I think is is what the the dark side of this tool is. Sure. 
And um, it's that we don't have to retain this memory. However, if you're going to make art, if you're going to make art or if you're going to design something, you you have to sort of like, have, have, you know, your brain has to look at something, translate that information. And then even if you're using technology like Photoshop or Illustrator or some drawing, you know, procreate, but you still have to translate that information into some real thing, some object, something that has to be produced. And so if if we move too far away from the maker's, you know, idea, um, then our culture will be, you know, stagnated. I mean, we could say, oh, well, artificial intelligence will take over, but artificial intelligence isn't anything but that. It's called artificial. Um, so, you know, it has to be input. So, I mean, it, they could steal everything from the New York Times, but it only goes up till now. So what happens in the future? Who has a new idea? Like who can reinvent something? So, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that has to happen with us being patient, like looking at something and thinking about it. I think if I hope that anyone learns anything is that it's that's really important sure. um, just to look at it. Just sure. to, like, how do you put the key in the keyhole? I mean, they even took that away from us. You know, now you just walk into the car and it starts up. You push a button. Yeah. No, it's you, you know, like, um, what, what happens, you know, on the operating table if the electricity goes off and the surgeon can only use applications and robots and there's no more robots or applications? He doesn't, they have to like, where do they cut? Yeah. Um, so the, the, this idea that um, automation takes over is really not um, sustainable over the long right. run. If you've ever listened to, to any uh, artificial intelligence reading something, you know, they don't get the words right. They never because they don't know how to pronounce words. And it's just so off putting to me uh the uh the way it the way it is but uh that's a little curmudgeonly you know kind of conversation um when i started in photography um we still used film and you had to understand film one of my teachers was the uh uh darkroom assistant for ansel adams and everything with ansel adams was plotted out. he was an engineer musician type you know, and everything had to be exact and not that was Purple Jones, not him, but another of my photography teachers. First day of class said, buy 100 rolls of film, go out and shoot them, look at it. Don't make the same mistake twice, you know, and um, because it's a process. Everything is a process. And if you don't understand process or if you are feeling like everything has to be immediate, um, you're going to be frustrated. Yeah, it's it's the instant gratification is um, I joke with my students because they have projects and they go out and um, they come back and they take one photograph of something. And I'm like, how expensive is your film? Yeah. I, you know, especially and, digitally now. <laughs> well, you know, mo a lot of the students have taken a, a photography class at Montserrat and it's a traditional photo class where they shoot black and white film and process okay. it. So they understand the process and they understand the expense, but, you know, taking a picture with your cell phone or like with a regular digital camera, it doesn't, you know, it's, it's sort of like, oh, I, I got it right on the first try. And this is, a, this is kind of the same thing about the, well, that's what it is, you know, this, this instant gratification, I'm done. And the idea that we're going to finish something, um, like right away and what you know so there's no there's this no idea about meditation over something to right. that the idea you talk about process and and what is process and everyone gets so confused about this idea of process of research and it basically research is just looking and trying and you know and the process is the things that happen along the way and so i i think that um so if if we continue to do that sort of thing, then we'll be okay. Um, curiosity. I think curiosity is a key component to, to artistic growth. You have to be curious. What if I do this? What if I try that? What if I looked at it this way? Um, very famous. Somebody, 
This is it, this is great because we were talking about this a few years ago about curiosity. And then one day I was listening to this woman talk about why she became an artist. And she said, you know, I, I think it's, you know, I want to say that I, I was, I'm curious, but really the reason that I'm an artist is because I'm nosy. And I thought, wow, nosy is really like much better of a term if you're nosy, you know, it's like, if you're curious, well, I'm kind of curious, you know, but if you're nosy, you're like, oh, I'm going to find out some more dirt on this, you know, and I, and, and so you keep looking further and further into it, you know, and so it's similar, but different. And um, I think if we, I think of that, that PBS commercial where the, the talker it's on, it's like those, those, um, tours they take on the river and he's like be curious and i'm like be nosy <laughs> yeah yeah I, I nosy has a kind of a different connotation to me it's someone who's putting their nose in something like nosy neighbors but yeah. she's using it in a very positive way where she she's just translating taking curiosity and making it nosy you know, yeah, I, I understand like nosy is, you know, I it sounds a little nastier, you know, in some ways, yeah. but but in a way, like, you know, if you're if you're going to buy a something, if you're going to buy a house, if you're going to buy a piece of property, you start looking into the neighbors, you start looking into the to the to the community, you start looking at the property, you look at the what it looks like, the trees that are there, the yeah. you get you know, like, what's the road like? How do you park here? You know, you, you start to ask, where's the closest hospital? Uh, like, where's the, you know, where can I go get food? Um, are there any restaurants, you know? And so it's the, it's a similar thing. And and that's like what the, that curiosity creates that sort of like. Sure. Of John, is there anything I haven't asked you that you wanted to talk about? Um, I, you know, I was, I'm willing to talk about just about anything. Um, one of the you know, reasons why I wanted you here. So, so I, I think like one of the things that I've learned along the way, and I have had, I haven't had as many careers as my mother had, um, but um, my father had a couple of different careers, mostly as a designer and a painter. Um, but we all have to, we go through, you know, different stages of life. And I mean, you were talking about being in the video business, photography, real estate. I mean, there's a lot of different places that we go along on this journey and you have to sort of embrace whatever is coming up next. And I think that's a really important thing for younger people to think about is that like what it is now isn't gonna be what it is later. I mean, when we think about, we were talking about there were no cell phones or there were no smartphones in 1998. I mean, I don't know when the Apple came out, but it was late after 2003 or four, somewhere around there. And so before that, we didn't have that. And so what would be the next invention? What is the next thing that's going to happen? And so it's kind of the same as with our careers, you know, they, they, they transform. And so I went to school for sculpture and I painted and I worked in graphic design and, you know, I, I became, you know, self-employed and I, um, you know, it's, and then I got a job teaching and I opened a gallery before that. And, you know, all these different things have happened along the way. Sure. And so I think it's like in um, the same thing about uh, curiosity and nosiness and all of that sort of thing is to um, be ready for the next thing that's coming. And, and instead of like, um, pushing it away, accept it and jump in, you know, just right. be looking for that. New for, for me, John, it was, uh, I've had three careers, commercial photographer, video producer, director, and, and now real estate. But for me, it's all the same thing. It's storytelling. Mm -hmm. And what story am I telling? So in real estate, I'm telling the story of, of the house, the neighborhood, the, you know, what it's like to live there, lifestyle of it. But all the other was, um, it was somebody else's idea. That's what's make it commercial versus fine art. Commercial art is, it's somebody else's idea and you're using your skills to, to do the best you can for them so they can use it for their commercial purpose. Fine artists, they often say, don't tell me what to do. I, I don't want to use orange, <laughs> you know? Uh, yeah, so how do you feel today? I feel like putting the rock over here. 
Um, yeah, I, I mean, I you know, I one of the things that I've learned is that uh, I first I didn't know I would be able to tell a story, and growing up, I like I didn't come from people that told a lot of stories, although I did hear a lot of stories. And going to college, my college professor Enrico Pinardi. Um, he told stories that would just flow up as, you know, and, and he would be telling these stories and we'd be like, where did that come from? You know, like he's off on a tangent again. And now I do the same thing. And, and, um, Henry Schwartz told stories, Malcolm Greer told great stories. Um, everyone told stories. And, and then I realized that like every single time that we encounter something, it becomes a story. Yeah. And. Um, and that's where our like memory comes into play and that and then to bring that because a lot of times, you know, there's a lesson in the story. Always. And, and and so sometimes it's not as clear, like there's a metaphor there. Yeah. there it's ironic. Um, there's something that's repetitive about something that's similar to something else. And so we get to we get to, you know, and, and I think artists. Um, see that they see because they spend a lot of time thinking about what they're trying to say. Um, I, I think it's important um, to understand what it is that you're looking at. So like, is there a meaning to that sort of flower? Yeah. You know, what kind of tree is that? You know, I mean, if you're going to spend the time to, I, I had a, this is kind of an interesting story. I had a student and, and he's, he was an adult student and he was from Japan and he was an excellent painter. I mean, he, he's, and so he, he, I was his advisor. I don't have very many painting advisors, but he, he wanted me to be his advisor. And so he painted this beautiful uh, painting of a building. He, he was on the Cambridge side of the Charles river and he painted this building over on the other side. And so I said, Oh, you painted a, you painted the Nashua street jail. And he said, that can't be a jail. It's too beautiful of a building. And I said, well, it is the jail. It's on one front property. You know, I said, they all have a great view over there, you know? And he's like, he disagreed with me. Even I showed him on the website, the building, a picture of the building, you know? And it's like, he painted this building and he spent a lot of time painting it and he didn't know what the building was. And I, I think that that's kind of a lesson because he, he didn't, he realized I painted a jail. And, um, but it was, a, that that's kind of sweet, you know, I mean, yeah. Um, if he had gone in with the idea that he knew what the building was, he might not have approached it with the same. Story. Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely. But I don't know when he did this, but that, that a jail. Couple years ago. Yeah. That jail has become a high end uh, hotel now, yeah. you know, so um, I don't think the outside has changed that much. It's the inside. But, but, if this is over on um this is the one that's on the waterfront it's the yeah. modern yeah 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 um and my tagline on my linkedin page is tell a better story get a better result and i think that's true is you really have to think about how you connect things and to to make it come alive to somebody um uh, in some way john it's just it's been a real pleasure to talk to you um uh, thank, thank you, you so much john colin uh professor at uh, Montserrat College, and also go visit some of the shows at uh, his gallery, The Hall Space in Dorchester. Thanks so much for being our guest today. Thank you. Uh, see you soon. See you at the next show, I guess. <laughs> <laughs>